Hello, my name is Carrie Cronin, Director of the New Market Public Library. Welcome to tonight's program on building community through the arts, which highlights several successful projects that have taken place and continue to take place in our Seacoast and Hampshire communities. This is program is part of the Oyster River Community Read based on Eric Kleinenberg's book, Palaces for the People, how social infrastructure can help fight inequality, polarization, and the decline of civic life, which has been a two month collaboration between the towns of Durham, Lee, Madbury, Newmarket, and Newfields, with more than 30 events taking place from mid September through mid November. For more information, please visit orcread.org. Tonight's panelists are as follows Jane Hirschberg, former Director of Development and Education at the Portsmouth Music Hall. Charlie Lawrence, retired supervisor at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, who will be speaking about the Shipyard Project, which was an initiative that brought the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard and Portsmouth community together through interpretive dance during the 1990s. Mimi White is our second speaker. She is the former Portsmouth Poet Laureate and co-founder of the Rye Energy Committee, who will present the who will present the history of how the Poet, Portsmouth Poet Laureate program was established and share the story of the Rye Wash Day project. And John Herman, um, local artist and educator will share his current work to establish a monument to honor Revolutionary War hero Wentworth Cheswell. Each panelist will be given between five to 10 minutes to describe the history of these dynamic initiatives. And I'd ask that you to please mute your microphones during the presentations and enter your questions into the chat. I will open the conversation for Q&A after everyone has had a chance to present. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Jane Hirschberg and Charlie Lawrence. Hello. Thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. Go for it, Charlie. Yeah, okay. I grew up on the seacoast of, of New Hampshire. I spent all of my adult productive life there. Minus seven years, I was active duty with the Army. <laughs> We had just decided to make the Army a career when they told me that there are too many officers in active duty, all your reservists to go home. At 25 years of age, a wife and two children, I had no job. Came back to the seacoast and the obvious, obvious best employer on was the shipyard, but it wasn't easy access. I had to work to get in there. It took me 14 months to finally get in the shipyard. Once in the shipyard, I went up the ladder pretty, pretty rapidly into the second level of supervision. It was a very rewarding job, but it was one that was shrouded in secrecy. Prior to the advent of occupational safety and health and OSHA programs <clears throat> and environmental impact, the shipyards did not have to answer the state of Maine. Anything that happened on the shipyard stayed in the shipyard. And the fact that the shipyard was the considered the economic engine for the seacoast need not answer to the seacoast for any of the activities or any concerns that the outsiders had of what goes on in the shipyard and how it took place. In the early 90s, the, there was a, a clamshell allowance, Alliance, was very adept at using the press and the media and were successful in stopping the construction of the second New Seabrook power plant. The next title, next target was the shipyard because we built nuclear submarines. We had nukes there and who knows their, their words, what other sins they were hiding on the shipyard. So now we've got two national security. We're coming off the Cold War. We don't have to do any of that stuff because we're doing it right, trust us. The fact that uh, hazardous materials were on the shipyard, what they were and how they were controlled or not controlled, did not come public until May State of Maine issued an inventory telling us exactly what we had. The Base Alignment and Closure Committee was very active at this point. Everyone was looking for a peace dividend from the, from the end of the Cold War. Where was all this money that supposed to be saving. We're not spending on Department of Defense anymore. Why do we have eight shipyards? Do we really need them? Do we need to have as many Air Force bases as we have? So the Base Realignment and Closure Commission was put together to identify those excess resources and eliminate them. 
the shipyard was now in a position where it needed to, in fact, recruit the That's communities why. outside the shipyard for support. You had added shares, though, right? I'm sorry? Shipyards needed the, needed the outside community support. Little did uh, the shipyard realize what they had when Liz Lorman was introduced to the shipyard at a luncheon. As vice president of the Federal Managers Association, we hosted the luncheon at the shipyard. And during the course of the luncheon, Liz explained to the participants that to the, by the story, by the process of storytelling and having individuals tell the story, working with a performer, we could in fact choreograph stories. And I said, sure, to myself, I don't believe this process. So the challenge was laid to Liz to solicit stories, choreograph them, and then perform them by the end of that lunch period. She did, and I became a convert at that point in time. It was excellent. As the pro program went forward, access to the shipyard was not being given freely. Everything was very structured. For the program to be a success, we needed to have access to the shipyard employees and to the facilities itself. So the suggestion was made that Liz, in fact, have a luncheon with the shipyard officers' wives. That luncheon took place. The wives came and both came aboard, and their husbands automatically fell in line. Funny how that happens, isn't it? <laughs> the good part about that was <clears throat> the supporters from the shipyard. The, numbers grew exponentially. The retirees, having heard what was going on in the shipyard now, says, wait a minute, how do we know that what you're telling is actual, fa is factual, and the whole story? We want to become involved. Again, the support of pool was growing. Uh, Dan McIsaac, a submarine veteran during World War II, relayed a story of how he was riding a Portsmouth submarine through a series of death charges. And the fact that he was very glad he was a Portsmouth built on a Portsmouth built submarine because he knew that he'd make it back to port. That was the that's the history. I'm telling you, it's fantastic. Jane. Thank you, Charlie. So <clears throat> one of the first things um, we did, I, I was working at the music hall at the time. Um, one of the first things we, well, the first thing I did was call Mayor Foley. Um, <clears throat> Eileen Foley was the mayor because I knew that she worked at the yard. And um, she gave me the names of all kinds of people. And every time I called one of the people whose name she gave me, I, got, I had 25 more names. And so that was the, the process of getting together with people and then having a similar meeting um, like what Charlie explained um, that happened for the manager's luncheon we had with a bunch of people from the community representing the shipyard, representing artists, representing the community of educators, K-12 educators, um, we formed our advisory committee. And the advisory committee really became the guiding force of that project because um, the artists, there were, there were different teams of artists um, from the dance exchange and they were based in <clears throat> the DC area. They come up, they came up probably for uh, anywhere from three to six days every couple of months over the course of two years. Um, and in between those visits, the committee would meet. And that's where um, we learned a lot about one another. We learned, I certainly learned about the human stories behind the facade of the military industrial complex with nuclear capabilities um, from the people that came to these meetings <clears throat> and the committee grew. It started out being around eight or nine people. And by the end, we had probably had 20 to 25 people coming regularly to these committee meetings and they designed really everything that happened in that project. Um, one of the stories that, that one thing that happened during one of our meetings, in fact, was that we had Gene Almendinger who was, um, one of the engineers who built the Thresher, which was an early early nuclear submarine, right, Charlie? Yep. Was it, it was a Thresher nuclear or diesel? It was nuclear. Yeah, it was nuclear. It was, it was nuclear. Yeah. And um, the, the I don't know if people know the story of the Thresher, but it went out for a trial run and it sank at, at sea, right in Portsmouth Harbor. And it killed everybody on board. 
and there were the 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 wife and one of the children of one of the people who was killed on the submarine were at the meeting that night and they met Jean Amendinger not they didn't know they were going to be in this room together at the same time but it was quite a moment when you know the the dependents of this person who was killed met one of the engineers who designed um the sub where their where their their family member was killed and it was in a, in that moment i remember feeling like we were we had touched on something that um probably never would have been able to happen if we hadn't invited people into a space where they could tell stories and tell them freely it was safe and we were very very careful about what we did with the stories and how they were translated into the artwork that eventually was part of nine different performances that happened um, over the course of a week um, that that involved both people from the community from the shipyard and the dancers from the company um, we had no idea that it was going to end up being a week-long um, event we thought it was going to be one performance but we had so much material so many stories came forward during that time um, it ended up that because of some of the security issues that Charlie referred to, um, we couldn't we couldn't have the public come onto the shipyard in droves, and so we would start uh, we started the week with an opening ceremony, and we're going to show a video in a couple minutes, mm -hmm. and a lot of what you'll see is footage from the opening ceremony, which is mostly the company um, performing some dances that they created based on the stories that they heard. Um, but you'll also see where the whole audience joins in um, and dances uh, a, a phrase that we ended up teaching throughout the entire project and ended up dancing it at the very, very end, which was a huge finale. Um, um, but we ended up having a, a, a performance in the morning at the yard and then performing performance in the afternoon in, in a public space. So once was one uh, performance was on the Albacore submarine um, that's in dock um, on Route 1 there. Another one was at St. John's Episcopal Church. Another one was at the Music Hall. Um, and then there was a fourth one. Where was the Where was the other one, Charlie? Oh, at, wait, I can't remember where there was another one. But there was the finale happened um, by having um, a group of people start at the, the gate of the shipyard and a group of people start at Prescott Park and we mark we we timed it so that we mark we were all walking together and we met in the middle of Memorial Bridge, and Eileen Foley tied a ribbon together. And on the ribbon there were things that there were um, dreams and hopes and dreams for a unified community that were written on different pieces of cloth that we had um, collected at a at a dinner that we did at a church during one of the company visits. And it was so symbolic of the company. I mean the community and the shipyard coming together um, as opposed to a ribbon cutting, you know, where it might indicate um, separation. And, and then we all ended up in Prescott Park for a big finale um, that involves all kinds of people. Um, I would say that for the, um, for the music hall, it was a, certainly a challenging and expensive project. It was much bigger than we were at that time. It was still a, a pretty small staff, um, but there was funding available that is no longer available in this country. Um, the arts ecosystem here in the United States has really, really shrunk dramatically in the last 20 years, as, as many of you know, if you're involved with the performing arts especially. Um, but we were quite fortunate um, with the timing of the project to be able to access some funding that was then, the, the, the bulk of the funding came from Lila, what was then the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund. And then we were able to garner some local support as well. Um, it, the, pro, the shipyard project became kind of a, um, an example of civic engagement involving the arts, which was something that was kind of an, a, it was a novel concept, relatively novel at that time. We're, we're talking early mid nineties. Um, and then it ended up spawning other funding programs. Um, the Ford Foundation founded a program called Animating Democracy and the shipyard project was held up as an example of the kinds of projects that Ford was looking to fund. Um, and then it just ended up and that, so that was sort of the national um, impact of it. And then of course the local impact of it, which you're gonna hear about from Mimi, is that there were people on the advisory committee that still wanted to keep making work. They wanted to make work together. They wanted to continue um, highlighting stories of people in the community 
through various forms of, of expression. And um, so many, many other projects were born uh, after the impetus of, the, of this advisory committee that we put together in order to kind of mine the stories of the, the 200 year history of the yard. Um, how am I doing, Carrie? Is it time? Oops, you're on mute. We we're at um, 20 after the hour. Do, do okay. you want to show the video? Or so, yeah, let's watch it. So I found I found a video. There's there's a lot of different videos. There was a, a full length video made by a crew um, that followed us around. Um, and this I think is some footage from what they collected. It's it's very it, it's very short. It's only a couple of minutes, but. I know that talking about what we're talking about, if you if you don't understand the way that the dance exchange works, or if you like Charlie and many of the shipyard workers were, you know, what are you talking about? You're gonna make a dance out of our stories. I think that this excerpt can show a little bit of what that was about. And it can certainly show the way the community really came out in droves to learn more about the yard, to learn more about the community history. And it was done in such a way that um, it was very, very accessible because there were stories and movement. And then you could tell from the movement that was derived from the stories and also by the work that the shipyard employees actually did on submarines, um, you could see in some of the movement exactly what, you know, what maybe was going on behind, behind the closed doors of the, of, the, of the yard. So I'm gonna, let's see, what do I do? I'm gonna share my screen and can you see it? If, if, can somebody say something if you can we see what I'm... We don't yeah. see it yet. Yeah. Oh, you don't see it yet there. Now? Yes. Yes, now I see it. We just need to hear the volume, Jane. Is that good? A little bit. Can you put it a little higher? Okay, hold on. Can you not hear it? No. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see if I can turn it up a little more. I'm going to turn that all the way up. I'm hoping that you're going to be able to hear it. We can turn our ours up higher. Yeah, if you if you all turn up your volume on our computers. Yeah. And it does. If we make a people if they knew about it. And that's a lot about what's been happening. We and all the audiences that we need have come to understand more about the pride you have in your work. The history of the people who come before you and how it connects to all of us. And we hope in exchange that you might think just a little differently about dancing and about moving. Great, thank you very much, Jane. Certainly. Excellent. 
So if anyone has questions, be sure to put them in the chat so we can um, read Could them she you. potentially, was that on YouTube? Could you send us that link so that sure. we could use it or put it in the, uh, the notes maybe, Carrie, so that we could share it and see it in an undisturbed form? Absolutely. I'll Thank you. That as a follow up. So welcome, Mimi White. Hello. I want to dance now. <laughs> I loved watching that. So, okay. So the segue is um, the shipyard project ends, and it's a big two years commitment. It's, it's, it was an amazing as a participant from the neighborhood to see it and to know about it. Uh, and to see that barrier come down because my husband worked there and I knew there was a lot of privacy and there still is. So it's 1997 now. And I believe the, the project ends in 96 or 97, Jane? Uh, yeah, somewhere. And um, Nancy Hill calls me. She is a um, reading specialist at the, at the middle school in Portsmouth. And she says, Mimi, meet me at Valley Steakhouse. For those of you who are relatively new, like you haven't lived here for 50 years. So Valley Steakhouse was on the Route 1 bypass and it's no longer there, but we met there. And she said, and Jane, you can help me. There was some grant money available to continue creating projects. Right. And she, she wanted to create something with poetry. So she called me because I'd worked with her as a visiting poet in the schools. So we sat down and we started talking and I said, well, there's a, there's a New Hampshire Poet Laureate. They serve for five years, they make no money. And there are other states Poet Laureates. I said, what if we have a Portsmouth Poet Laureate except ours is going to get paid. And this position has been funded ever since and the money for the Poet Laureate continues to rise. At the beginning, it was a one-year commitment, and now it's a two-year commitment. And our first poet laureate was Esther Buffler, who was a great grand dame of, of everything, actually, especially poetry and wild, gorgeous Jane, and that you had to create a structure. The committee had to create a structure. How, do you, how does someone become a poet laureate? What are the qualifications? How do you send out that message? Who will then judge? And who are those people from the communities who will judge whether that should be a poet laureate? Um, and slowly more people came in. Paula Race came in, Marin Tarabasi came in. Nancy called on all her colleagues, especially those who were good with money. So we had a really good treasurer. And we did actually have a benefactor the first few years. And I do forget his name. Um, and he just funded, he funded it. So after that first year, our second poet was Robert Dunn. And anybody who has been around Portsmouth for a while I hope there are some people on this Zoom who knew Robert. Um, I did. Robert was a character. He was reclusive and quiet, but brilliant. And he walked around town in his black trench coat and he gave his poems, which I think he folded into little books. One poet, one poem um, cost a penny. So he was known as the penny poet of Portsmouth. And he would sometimes walk into cafes and he would start reciting his poetry. And he wanted to create a community where people would read together. And he created the Poetry Hoot, which just started its 23rd season. That's where the Poet Laureate of, of Portsmouth comes and introduces two guest poets and they read and then community people who sign up, read their poems together for a couple hours. And we create community that way. And that Hoot has been going on for a long time through thick and thin, we were in restaurants, we were in the Women's City Club, and now we're at the Book and Bar restaurant in Portsmouth, and I think it's the second Wednesday of each month. Robert also was very interested in bringing in something larger than what happens all the time in Portsmouth. And so there was an International Poetry Day, and he created with his committee, the World Poetry Forum. And they invited four poets who were immigrants, who then who now live in the United States? So the three out of the four that they talked to invited Ben to come to come read were in the ports of Boston vicinity. So they invited Laura Ann Bossillard, who was from Belgium, Danielle Georges, a Haitian writer, and Ilya 
Kaminsky, Kaminsky who is a Russian um, poet, and George uh, and, and a dorm writer, Karim Durdag, who is from Pakistan and Turkey. And they recited their poems, mostly in English, but each one of them read in their foreign tongue. And it was an opportunity for the Portsmouth audience to hear poetry from another country and to hear what it's like to be an immigrant writing in America. And th there's a very brief clip that I want to just read to you on, on Durdag. Uh, he says, I'm just trying to get people to understand that there's more to American poetry. They need to be exposed to different styles and different emotions. He says he enjoys reading his, his work to audiences. And he says, the oral tradition in the United States is still young. In Pakistan and Turkey, people know poems by heart. So they had an opportunity to see and experience outside of their realm. And um, 120 people showed up at the Sheridan to watch this in a nor'easter. So there was a huge support for the voices from away from people who had chosen to make this, this place their home. And I bring that up because it was a large ambitious project from a man who walked around town giving his poems away for a penny. Um, it, was, it was very, very interesting. And the other one I wanna highlight is one by Tammy Truock. Tammy was our 12th poet laureate during the, the um, pandemic. So the poor, this poor woman's, you know, people say, can you do another term? It's basically, you're trying to run a poetry program where nobody can go anywhere. And so she was going to go to Japan because she wanted to do something on bridges and she wanted to take um, school, school children, high school students were going to go to Japan with their teacher to the, to the sister city called Nichina. And so they had, they did have, um, projects, but it all happened on Zoom, writing with, in Japanese form, um, 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 collaborating. I, I participated and collaborated with Sarah Haskell, who's a weaver, created art, created a virtual ex, um, exhibit and um, had programming around it. And she also decided on her own that she would write a haiku a day and she would she would post that. So as luck would have it, the New York Times picked up one of the haiku and the story of the poet laureate who read her poem every day to, to whatever audience was listening. And that audience then got larger as that poem went to different communities around the world, wherever the New York Times goes, it went. And it turned out to be not just creating community, but for those of us who were in the dark and isolated, it created a sense of um, hope and belonging and, and that you're not alone. A poetry did, did that. And Tammy, hats off to Tammy to, you know, staying in there for close to four years <laughs> till it was time to pass the baton. Um, those are two of the Poet Laureate projects. And, and if anybody has questions, I'll tell you about what mine was later. It was called What is Home? And it still resonates. Many people, have continued writing together with whatever group they met with when they started with the Poet Laureate Project. Many people have, have created friends. Many people have, some people have married. Um, it, it seems so simple. You get together and you write poems and you share them and maybe you make art to go with it. We never danced. I don't think, oh, but you know what we did do with my project? We did incorporate Pontine, movement theater. So some of those poems were set to movement and the poets read it and Pontine actors um, moved, them, moved, uh, moved it out. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about that project, um, about Robert, well, I can't, I can't think of her right now, but Nancy, Nancy made a point of saying the committee, like you say, Jane, this executive committee did the work, the committee, make sure that the poet can do what, they've dream, what they're dreaming of. She said, your job is to dream up something. Dream it up and we'll make it happen. That's, that's the beauty and the, and the weakness of, of the pro program. And I, I don't wanna be, I'm not negative. I'm just saying there are challenges. And we've been around now since 
um, what do you say, 19, 1997. So it's a long time and it has, it has had its ups and downs. And one of the biggest problems is how do we get people to stay on that committee? How do we get new blood onto that committee so that they can do the, they do the grunt work. I mean, the poet laureate does as well, but they do it, they figure it out. And I think it, it, ebbs, it ebbs and flows. Um, and the other problem is getting people to apply to be the poet laureate because they discover that it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's really a lot of work, which is why we pay them. Poets don't get paid usually. So that's, that's the Poet Laureate Project. And that's what came out of the Shipyard Project. One of the, one of the projects. I don't know if Jane, do you have this book? Yeah. So this is um, the Community Arts in Portsmouth telling our stories. And it does have a timeline and all the dozens of programs that's, that, were, that grew out of the Shipyard Project, which I think is still happening in some ways. The second project I want to tell you about very briefly is um, back after I finished being the Poet Laureate, I was 2005 to 2007, I really want to do something about climate change. And there was initiative on the ballots in New Hampshire to set up um, energy committees. So I started our town's energy committee, which was basically to help people reduce their carbon footprint. And um, I believed that art changes behavior. I think that when you involve art in a project, it's a way to change how people think and feel. So in this sense, in this instance, I wanted people to hang their laundry out and have a look at well, how much carbon do you not put into the atmosphere? How much money are you saving? And um, wouldn't it be nice to have a group of visual artists come through and paint your clotheslines? So people signed up who wanted to have their their wanted to hang out their laundry, and I got the funniest conversations. People told me about ironing and how their mother spritzed the the um, the laundry with water so it would it would steam and get out folds. And people talked about um, all kinds of things, how to hang your laundry, where do you keep your underwear, what do you put in front of it, everything about the, about the uh, skills of, of hanging laundry. So artists went through and we partnered with the Science Center. Any project I've worked on, I've tried to partner with everybody that I can think of, especially people who have buildings, because we were always dreaming things up without a place to do anything. So the Science Center said, yeah, we'll, we'll work with you. So the People hung out their laundry, the artists painted the paintings, we hung the paintings on the wall, people came and bought the paintings and we raised more money for the Poet Laureate Program, the Science Center and the artist. And I believe Carrie has one of those paintings in her house and I have one in my house. Um, and, and it went on a little further. And those are the two projects that, that I came to talk about and I'll answer any questions you have later. Thanks. Thank you. That's wonderful. I appreciate it. Um, John Herman, welcome. Um, our local presenter to talk about um, his work estab to establish a monument to Wentworth Cheswell. So John, let me um, make you the co-host so you can share your presentation. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is John Herman. I am an educator in Newmarket, and I am First of all, um, honored to be asked to speak about a project that is really in its infancy in comparison um, to all of these projects. Um, so I'm going to jump in um, right, segueing from Mimi, who in 1995 or six, um, okay. I met as uh, she <laughs> was a poet in my school. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's my start. That's my origin story. So. Um, <laughs> share my screen and jump right into what I'm working on. All right, so um, in the annals of American history, there are a lot of names and faces that are, you know, instantly recognizable. These individuals are basically the, the history of early America. But uh, I've been working on a project with different members of my community, uh, increasingly more and more people, around remembering someone else, someone who we believe can teach us something about our own community as well as America. 
So, and that individual is Wentworth Cheswell, who was born and lived and worked in Newmarket, New Hampshire, but had ties all over the seacoast. So I'm gonna kind of break down um, why Wentworth Cheswell, and then I'll begin to reveal what the project is. Um, first of all, I'll tell you that we're in about year one and a half of what we've been told could be probably a, a five-year project. So Wentworth Cheswell uh, was an educator, first and foremost. I was inspired by a roadside historical marker that was established in 2007, uh, literally driving by the school. And that marker was um, uh, the, the work of a bunch of community members. But first and foremost, I want to shout out to Richard Alperin, who I know is watching tonight. Um, so I was inspired. Um, the, the idea that he was an educator inspired me, but also he was a prolific um, individual in terms of public service. Uh, he not only served in like just about every town role that was created uh, for this community, um, but he established a lot of these roles. He was uh, an inaugural school board member. He was a judge. He was a justice of peace for the county. But the bolded one, constable in 1768, is pretty important. And I'm going to go back to that in just a moment. So um, he was passionate about history of our community. Uh, his early uh, research was sent to Jeremy Belknap, and Jeremy Belknap cited uh, Wentworth Cheswell in his first history of New Hampshire. Uh, he wrote a letter uh, or two in 1790 and talking about his work doing archaeological work. And in fact, Wentworth Cheswell uh, is regarded as a pioneering archaeologist. I'm allowed to say he was New Hampshire's first archaeologist because the work I'm doing this month is really to see if he is potentially the first archaeologist uh, or one of the first in the nation. Uh, his work probably happened around 1775 up in Ossipee Pond, and the other contender is actually Thomas Jefferson, is the father of American archaeology. He dug into a burial mound at Monticello somewhere between 1773 and 1780. Uh, he never actually wrote down what date he did. So um, Wentworth Cheswell was a archeologist, early archeologist, but when the revolution started and rumblings right before the revolution started, he was part of the committee of safety. So was he, he was a messenger on the seacoast uh, carrying the kind of secret undermining messages that would later um, feed into one of these grand seacoast events. Um, if anyone is a fan of Revolutionary War history in New Hampshire, we will say that the raid on Fort William and Mary in 1774, that December, which predated Lexington and Concord, is actually the true start of the American Revolution. During the Revolution, uh, Cheswell fought with others in the Battle of Saratoga, America's first victory in the Revolution. He came back to New Hampshire and established um, one of the early libraries in our community. Um, his passion for history, his passion for civic duty. He, he was an educator. I was just really inspired. And I pretty much researched him in isolation until I started speaking up. And the more and more I spoke up and started to share what I was learning, I learned that there were others out there who were also passionate. So I would tell people he was a patriot, he was a teacher, he was a veteran, he was a historian. Uh, and so I wrote a poem to spread the word. <laughs> it had worked for Paul Revere. Now, many people don't realize after they had established the design for Paul Revere's statue in what is now Paul Revere Plaza in Boston, it took 57 years before they took the design and they revealed the statue. So. Um, what's happened in these past few years is kind of a grassroots movement to not only remember Wentworth Cheswell, but to establish a statue. So I have performed poetry based on Wentworth Cheswell. I've written a screenplay. I'm about 70 pages into a slim biopic. 
Um, but the statue has become this thing where people are like, this is, this is the way we will remember him. So I have worked with the Newmarket Public Library and we recently did a story walk for his 275th birthday. Um, so the community members um, would be a little bit more educated. Every single time people hear about Wentworth Cheswell, they want to learn more. And so I talk about it. Um, I've been spreading the news as Wentworth Cheswell did um, on television and radio, which he, he didn't have the opportunity to do. Now, the thing is that the more I talk, people say, well, uh, and this was in, initially, people would say, we can't build a statue because we don't know what he looked like. And that has closed doors. Recently, there was an a effort to put a Wentworth Cheswell painting in the state house and people stopped it and voted against it because they didn't know what he looked like. Now, my counter argument is that we actually don't know what Shakespeare, Pocahontas, or Christopher Columbus looked like. These are three individuals that have many paintings and many statues, but if you research what they actually looked like, none of these images um, and renditions were contemporary. Um, Shakespeare in particular, um, is based on a small statue that went over his grave three years after his death. <laughs> so we don't know what these people look like, but we want to remember them. So uh, the thing about Wentworth Cheswell is uh, an accolade um, is that he was the first African-American elected to public office in the United States. If you Google him, these are the images that come up. These two individuals to the right are not Wentworth Cheswell. There aren't a lot of images. The only image that I could find that was someone's actual rendition is the gentleman on the horse. Um, so I've been inspired to create images. Um, I have done some uh, comic strip, which has been distributed in local schools. And I have done a lino uh, block print um, I, I'm a printmaker and I have been kind of giving these away to anybody that I feel has been working towards uh, spreading the word about Wentworth Cheswell. So uh, recently in this past year and a half, um, we've had public events to get the community educated about Wentworth Cheswell and increasingly it has been about a statue. So at our most recent event for his 275th birthday, we had um, public input. And it, we had a bunch of designs and a bunch of locations. And it seemed pretty clear that people didn't want to put him up on a pedestal like uh, Paul Revere, for example. They wanted something more tactile. They wanted to sit next to him. Um, and they wanted to represent education. They didn't want to put a gun in his hand. So this is a, a quick sketch that I did at my desk um, that is a culmination of the direction that the statue is going in, which would be kind of a granite bench and him inviting you to sit along and read with him. So uh, that's what I'm working on. And again, it's in its infancy. Uh, I feel like we could get this done in a few years, but everyone's like a statue that takes that takes a while, but I'm willing to work on it. And I'm and I've got community members behind me. So thank you. Nice. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. That was great. So let's move on to questions. These are great presentations. Thanks to everyone. Um, just looking at the chat. Um, it looks like Deborah has a question. Who is funding the statue? That is a great question. So we've raised uh, 10,000 so far, approximately 10,000 in individual donations. Um, we have a fiscal sponsorship and from the, we're partnering with the New Market Historical Society, but honestly, like it's, it's been very grassroots. We're kind of building the plane as we're flying it. Um, so it's been quite exciting. Uh, it, it's every time I give a talk like this, we get more and more ideas. Uh, keep in mind that it started because I wanted to write a poem to spread the word about this individual. And now we're about a year and a half into it and we've got 10,000 towards a statue. We've got a rudimentary design that's gonna be finalized uh, hopefully shortly. And so 
if you have ideas for for funding, um, we are we are taking a lot of ideas right now. Great. Kristen has a question for you, John. Can you share a way we can sign up to be supportive and get involved in the project? Uh, right now, I've been kind of posting intermittent updates uh, on Facebook. I, I created a project name for my um, charming, nervous passion over this, <laughs> which is the Wentworth Cheswell Appreciation Society. Um, but honestly, like if you contact the New, New Market Historical Society, they would they would direct you towards me as well. Great. This question's from Mimi. Sue Kaufman would like to know: Are there copies of Telling Our Stories available? Oh, yeah. I think you need to. Yeah. Not that I know of, unless people have a stash in their you know attic. Uh, Paula Race had a couple extra ones, so she gave me one. And I know Katie Tyler has one somewhere, but I don't know if there's a stash of them anywhere. Um, and I don't know if it's worth re, you know, republishing it. It actually is, has a lot of the history. It's very succinct. And, and anybody who wants to know the breadth of programming that grew out of the shipyard project, this is pretty amazing. I mean, even in <clears throat> it from 1997, there was the Poet Laureate Project, then Lullabies and Revelies, the Three Generations Poetry Projects, Neighborhood, Corral Jubilee uh, two, 2000, and then the Mayor Forms a Blue Ribbon Committee. And that's in five years. You know, these things just are popping up all over the place. So Deborah has a question, is it in any library? So we'll have to look into how we can get a hold of it through interlibrary loan. And Good idea. that available as well. Um, are there other questions for any of the presenters? If not, I have a few. <laughs> Good start. Um, how about, I'll ask one, what aspect of the collaboration stayed with you after the project ended? And any of the presenters can answer. Mm. All right. Just unmute yourselves. Jane, I think you, Jane, you're muted, I think. A little louder. Okay. I'll try to see if I can. Um, for me, it informed my entire career trajectory, I would say, because um, everything that I experienced during the shipyard project is informing everything that I did um afterwards and and the way that i do my work now i work at a performing arts center at the performing arts center at the university of maryland in college park and the whole process of inquiry which was so prevalent through the way that uh liz and the company did their work pretty much permeates the way that permeates the way that i do my work with my colleagues and with artists so it was more a process the process of the work that i think has informed the way that I do my work now. I don't know if you want to respond, Charlie. Charlie, you might be muted. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Just need to unmute. No. There you go. No, you did well, Jane. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I did want to share. Um, my feelings around doing a large poetry project, because we had lots of community, other, other, as I pointed out, arts organizations involved in ours. And it, after a while, I thought, what have I done? You know, what is this? And what I discovered was it was, it was, it was like a living thing. People kept talking about what is home. The idea was really interesting, and it still comes up. People will say, that was a good project. I think about this. I think about it. And now I think about it because I'm thinking of selling my home after 50 years. It, it comes up. Um, and even you know, the ones I highlighted about people who had, who, who had immigrated here, they, um, they, what is home to them? So 
I was surprised at how big it was and yet it had meaning. And I also discovered that after I created something really big, I only wanted to work on small things. I only wanted to use poetry as a tool, as itself. Like when I came to the library and we sat under the tree, mm -hmm. nine of us or seven of us, and we wrote poems together, that mm -hmm. to me was a cathedral. Mm -hmm. That to me was community. And people touched each other in meaningful ways. And then they went home. But I think you get changed by that. And so I saw poetry as a tool. For me, it was also a survival tool to use when I needed to be able to write a lot. Um, so I, I learned the, the intrinsic value of poetry is, is about as strong as I had hoped it was. That's wonderful. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. That poetry session on the lawn there in front of the library was just excellent. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I thought it was wonderful. And I my my vote would be for this monument to win with Cheswell to be on the library lawn. I don't know what progress has been made on where it would be located, but a poem, I think, with the monument would be excellent. Thank you for the input. <laughs> That's, I, I love your passion. You can join us. <laughs> so Kristen also posted that she was grateful to be in the poetry workshop under the tree. Thank you, Mimi. Hope we do it again. And Nancy asks, how is the po Portsmouth Poet Laureate funded? That's a good question. Um, a lot, when I was on the board, we did apply for, for grants from different organizations. We got some from the State Council on the Arts, and there were private uh, organizations as well. And we did have a benefactor at the beginning. Uh, people donate. Um, and I don't know how much the Poet Laureate was getting 500, but I think now they might get 1,000, um, which isn't a lot for you know two years of work. But it's certainly significant in that it would have been nothing if they had become the State Poet Laureate for five years. Um, but they always welcome contributions and you can contribute, get on PPLP online and you can donate there if you feel so moved. That would be a good idea. You know, I should mention anyone can just put their hand up or unmute if you'd like to ask the question directly rather than the chat, feel free to just call out. We'd love to hear from you. And, and the presenters, feel free to ask questions of the others if you have questions for the folks on the panel. I, I, I do have a, an observation. John's is brand new. It's percolating. It's fermenting. It's just wonderful to see something like that that's vital and you can't stop not doing the work, you know. And then it's going to become something. Then what? And with, with the shipyard project, it was a giant two year project that had people moving who didn't think they would ever be able to move that way. Then, then what? And I look at the Poet Laureate program as if we wanted, as if we thought we could go on forever. I don't think that's possible. So my question is, how do you know when you're done? How do you know that this project is done and that you don't do it, that you've done it and it's over? You can't replicate the shipyard project and you can't find another person to be excited about once, once, the, once the statue is stationary and, and alive in the world. I don't know. That's sort of what I'm using about. If I may. Yes. I don't think we're ever done. I, I think if you become impassioned with a project, it becomes incumbent upon you to find someone else to follow on in your place. If you talk to the children that were involved in the shipyard project, they got it. And they're carrying forward with that project and the, the, the lessons they learned from the project. That's the key. Get the kids involved. They learn, they want to, they want to do something and they learn from it. Thank you. I, I want to chime in, um, Mimi, my mm -hmm. old friend, I, I think, I think, um, I'm not sure, and I wanna build on what was just said because I agree with it. I'm not sure things 
are end like that, but they shift and morph into something else that's appropriate for the times, right? So it's very rare, I think, that something's completely lost. I think it just adapts and evolves, right? Um, I don't know. It's my experience, especially the arts, because you're talking about creativity, right? So the arts lend itself so beautifully to morphing and shifting. So I think there's some hope in, in thinking of it in that way. And looking at Jane, you know, it embodied you. And then you you acted it out. You're doing all this work based on how, how do you get in, how do you organize something through asking questions and telling asking questions and telling the story. And then and then someone listening and someone saying, why don't we try this or that? But I don't know if it can get nailed down because then I think it loses its vitality, but it, I like that it gets transformed. I can tell you that, I mean, a lot, I have done a lot of uh, projects and I like that they pass mm -hmm. and that, you know, I get inspired to do something else. I'm actually kind of uh, scared to do something and work on something that has permanence. And, um, you know, I have been inspired by by past local artists and big projects, and then it's inspired me to get off my butt and do things for the community. Um, but to have something permanent is actually a little scary. So there is something about the something that comes and inspires and strikes people's hearts and then fades into the past. There, I think there's value to that. Hmm. But don't you think, John, you have a responsibility? You are bringing this man from the history of all he's done. He is, once you make a statue, he is not dying. I he know. is not going away. <laughs> no, it's a, that, you're, you're making me scared. No, I agree. No, you shouldn't be scared. I, I see all of the opportunity that you have to bring him to life, to let him be an example in this community of something so far in the past that should be an example for today. That list of community service is one of the things that we are struggling with as a world today. We cannot get people to step forward and do all of those roles that he did. So he needs to be so much more influential than just that statue. I yeah. mean, I, I have copious notes here of what he can become in our community and that there are probably other people like him um, maybe not as far back, but maybe as far back if we, the couple of the words and lines that you other folks shared was um, that whole line of animating democracy has great power of animating democracy is, and, and it isn't just in a stagnant statue because that statue, because you were inviting me to sit down beside him and to learn his story is animating democracy. And there are so many more things that we can do to animate democracy moving forward. I think it's what this town needs and what the state needs as we started our very offhanded conversation about elections, that there's a, a very deep seated value here, John, and you are at the edge of it, very much the edge of it. When, um, when I say I'm more. scared, I only mean that uh, I want to do it right. <laughs> and you will. There's not even a doubt that you will. Richard, you want to? Um, I just wanted to talk about John's uh, story walk project that was up at the library for a while. Um, uh, the seventh generation descendant of Wentworth Cheswell, who has worked with me on restoring the graveyard, has agreed that John can continue his story walk, which was at the library, by uh, placing it around the graveyard. And that I think is something that would help do exactly what uh, this person was um, just talking about, continuing the education so that it's something that doesn't just stop with a statue. So I just wanted to bring that up now that all, all 21 of the headstones which were broken and buried and gone forever and the graveyard was overgrown and there was no lawn, it's all been done, it's all been fixed. And John is aware that uh, we've invited him to permanently put up his story walk around the graveyard. Wow, that's wonderful. 
And there's so many people that walk in cemeteries. It's a great opportunity for them to stop, read, contemplate, right? Yep. So I, I just want to thank Jane, who needs to, to, to leave in a moment. And um, we are a little over after eight. So if anyone else needs to leave, feel free to do so. If others um, still have questions and, and are able to stay for a few more minutes, um, we'll keep going as long as um, there are questions. But thank you, Jane and Charlie and um, Mimi and John. This was an incredible presentation. I appreciate sharing your sharing these wonderful stories with all of us and they're so inspiring. And there's some feedback in the chat. I wanna be sure you have a chance to hear. Um, Thanks everybody. It was good to see you. you. Good to see you. Bye. Take good care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. So the, there's some feedback. Uh, Kristen says, this is so inspiring. Thank you all for sharing your projects. The arts continues to be a beautiful way to bring people together. And Amelia, these are great projects. Thanks for sharing your experience and keep dreaming big. There are a couple more in the chat, some additional words of thanks. Um, Deborah would like to, Deborah Smith as chair of arts and tourism would like to meet with John and learn more about his work. So lots of thanks for the inspiration. This was a really incredible, great conversation. Um, and Phyllis, thank you, Charles, for men the men mentioning the role of children going forward. I would venture to say a children's book should be next. Thank you all. That's a great note to end on. So are there any additional questions or comments from folks who are remaining? I'm going to say thank you all. It was a really good discussion. And thank you, Carrie, for putting it together. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you, you for being part of it. Carrie, like Carrie, can you just give a plug for Sunday's event we're going to do at Mount uh, at Vernon Farm? Sure. At four o'clock. You can. Do you want to mention it? Since you. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, in a, in celebration of the community read this year, we're going to just have a super fun community gathering at beautiful Vernon Farm in Newfields. If you have never.